Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, and welcome to the Madden America podcast. My name is Julia Lejeune. I'm a doctoral student in clinical psychology at the University of Illinois at Chicago and a science news writer at Madden America. This week, we will hear from Dr. Pada Suyamoto. Pada is a feminist scholar, educator, curriculum developer, activist, artist, and avid bicyclist. She earned her PhD in education from the University of Pennsylvania, where she conducted research on multicultural and anti-racist education. She has extensive teaching and advocacy experience working at the intersection of racial equity and mental health. Currently, she is the training director for the National Asian American Pacific Islander Mental Health Association and leads the National Asian American Pacific Islander Empowerment Network. Pata has also emerged as a leader in the field of suicide prevention at the local and national level. She's the equity coordinator for the Massachusetts Coalition for Suicide Prevention, the co-chair of the Greater Boston Regional Suicide Prevention Coalition, and formerly served as a consultant for the American Association of Suicidology. She is the co-author of Widening the Lens, Exploring the Role of Social Justice in Suicide Prevention, a Racial Equity Toolkit. Pata has spoken and written about being a suicide attempt survivor herself and about her struggles with chronic depression and PTSD. She is also the co-founder of the Breaking Silences Project, which is an artistic endeavor that educates about the high rates of depression and suicide amongst young Asian American women. Today on the podcast, Pata talks about how her identities as an Asian American and as a lifelong educator shape her current activism. And she shares the progress she is making towards building a network of Asian Americans with lived experience of mental health challenges. In our conversation, Pata also shares her perspectives on the formation of equitable and meaningful partnerships with those with lived experience in research, advocacy, and therapeutic contexts. Thank you so much, Pata, for taking the time out of your very busy life to speak with me. Um, Since I've known you, I've always been so in awe of the many different hats you wear and really inspired by the impact that you've had as a leader across so many different sectors. You've made waves in in research, policy, government, advocacy spaces, and community-based grassroots organizations. Um, You're a scholar, a trainer, a poet, and for many years, you've been really an advocate at the local, state, and national level to advance racial justice and equity in mental health and in suicide prevention in particular. In one of our previous conversations, you shared with me that cutting across all of these roles and the hats that you wear, you really see yourself as a health educator and activist primarily. Um, And I'd love to hear more about that from your perspective and to hear about what led you to health and mental health education and activism as a practice. um, And how has your role as an educator morphed over time? Well, I feel like I have uh, been chosen to be an educator, like by the universe or whatever. I have been blessed. I've taught everything I've ever loved to do, which includes art and writing and biology and sign language and Reiki and bicycle riding and jewelry making. I really uh, feel like I've taught everything I've ever loved to do. And I've taught preschool to graduate students. So, um, you know, I I just I feel like that was what I was meant to do in the world. I feel very um, lucky that I feel like I've made uh, lemonade out of lemons. I struggle with my own um, mental health challenges. I have major depression and complex PTSD and, um, you know, really was yeah, kind of down for the count for a few years, like really on disability and very. compromised in what I could do um, and, you know, went through that darkness, really, um, and came out, you know, sort of peeked out the other side and thought, well, you know, if I'm going to have these conditions uh, and I can help someone by sharing my story, being a support, then I was going to do that. So it kind of went from I was teaching at the university and I was teaching in a teacher education program. 
at a university um, and doing multicultural education, anti-racist education, that kind of thing. Um, and, um, you know, then I couldn't do it anymore. So I had to leave the university. And then it was sort of like, well, what am I doing now? Right. And for a while there, it was just healing was the answer. And then the second thing was, OK, well, what can I do with this state, with this person, this you know person with lived experience? And how can I use that lived experience, you know, to to help someone else? So that's that's sort of where that ended up moving into. And I also uh, got connected with the Asian American community, you know, um, in Boston and realized there was a huge need in our community to talk about mental health because it's so stigmatized in our community. As I started sharing my story um, in the community, I'd have young Asian American women line up to talk to me afterwards. And I thought, OK, this is something that's important. And, you know, because these, these young people were, were, you know, they're struggling in terms of being able to manage their own mental health concerns and not having anybody in the community you know, they can talk to because it's so stigmatized. They can't talk to their parents. You know, no one's going to go into a clinic. So it's, you know, it's really gotten into using my um, education, my uh, experience and combining it all together. You know, I have a PhD in education and, you know, really I studied anti-racist education and multicultural education and how to teach teachers and that kind of thing. Um, but I use all of that teaching experience in the work I do as a mental health activist and educator. Yeah, thank you. It makes, it, it does make a lot of sense. I think sometimes on paper, it's like, oh, this person has been in so many different roles and spaces, but it's really true that you have been responding to the same calling and using these same skills across all of these contexts. And I, I think using all of my a lot of my identity too, you know what I mean. Like I mean, as an Asian American person, you know, I talk about that. I talk about what it means to be a child of a father who was interned in the World War II, um, and the legacy of trauma that that causes, um, historical trauma, intergenerational trauma. Um, you know, particularly in our current world, our very racist United States. Um, so uh, I think that that has allowed me, you know, to really dig deep in certain areas, you know, about, um, well, how, you know, what does it mean to be Asian American and with a mental health concern? Like, what does that mean to me? And, you know, what does it mean to the world and how is that received or not received? And, um, I think one of the, you know, one of the ways in which you have kind of done, used that identity and done that identity work, with, and infuse that with your activism has been the development of this toolkit for suicide prevention. And so you developed this toolkit for organizations that are engaged in suicide prevention advocacy and work to use to center racial equity in that work. Um, and it's called Widening the Lens, Exploring the Role of Social Justice and Suicide Prevention, a Racial Equity Toolkit. And I'd, yeah, I'd be so curious to hear more about what your motivations were for creating this resource what was the process like of choosing, you know, what to put into it? If you could also speak broadly to, you know, why is it so essential that we, we center racial justice and equity in suicide prevention? First, I want to say that I didn't develop the toolkit alone. Um, Jennifer Kelleher, the managed, managing director of the Mass Coalition for Suicide Prevention, uh, you know, we, we worked together uh, to develop the toolkit with the, our um, MCSP's Alliance for Equity, which is our committee, our equity committee at the Mass Coalition. It was definitely, you know, a, a collaborative process. Um, but I think, you know, what motivated me to, to do the toolkit was when I came to the Mass Coalition for Suicide Prevention, um, I was an, a representative on the executive committee from uh, a regional coalition. And when I got to the executive committee, I asked Jen, how many people of color are on it? And she said, you're replacing the only one. I looked at her and I said, well, you know, we need to do something about this and we need to start this Alliance for Equity, you know, and the Alliance for Equity has a people of color caucus and a white ally caucus, but uh, intentionally, because there's times when people of color need to talk among themselves and there's times when white allies need to talk amongst themselves. But from that, it, it 
it, it struck me that there was nothing in suicide prevention or mental health that was dealing with racial equity and combined, you know, at the intersection, right? There wasn't another toolkit. There wasn't anything that was out there that could help guide us in this process. So, I mean, you know, coming from a curriculum development background, coming from a DEI background, I thought, well, we have to do something about this, right? And so let's start thinking about how we would go about uh, changing the culture, the kind of work we do, the lens we use, et cetera. So we started developing it really for ourselves, right? Because we were looking at our coalition as a place that needed to be moved along that dial, right? That equity dial, if you will, move toward more equity. And, um, you know, as, and it's a, it's a living document. So um, we have a sec- the version that's out now is our second edition. And we added some things, particularly, uh, you know, we added some things on white supremacy culture, for instance. So, you know, this, the toolkit, uh, you know, centers racial equity. And we started with racial equity because it's so problematic in our, in our country. And it's not to say that there are other, er- other inequities that are not, as uh, horrible, <laughs> you know, um, uh, p- particularly in suicide, you know, we see LGBTQ plus folks, you know, struggling with suicide and mental health concerns at a higher rate, you know. So, but we we decided to start with the racial equity because uh, we knew that everyone was uncomfortable with it, <laughs> um, and that you know, starting there allowed us to then say, and now we're moving into saying, okay, what are other intersectional identities, right? Because we're not just one person. We're, we are, you know, we're, I mean, we're not just one identity. We're one person with many identities. So how does that function? And how do we pay attention to other inequities still centering the racial equity, but not ignoring the fact that this is compounded in, in, intersectionally if you are, you know, a person of color with a, uh, a disability or a person of color with, you know, or whatever, differently abled or, or you know, uh, person of color and, and transgender, like, you know, these things are compounded. And so, um, you know, we're, we're moving into that space now where we're saying, okay, you know, we don't, we're not going to ignore all the other inequities, but we're going to keep centered on racial equity because it hasn't, it's not going away. Right. And we need to make sure. Um, and, you know, people are uncomfortable with that to some degree because people want to move off racial equity. They want to go into something else because it is uncomfortable. And to stay there, it's uncomfortable. But we're saying, no, we're not going to move off that. We're actually going to stay there and add, right? So our next toolkit we're working on, and it's not coming out anytime soon. It's, at least it takes a long time to develop them, but um, is on gender um, and, the, and looking at intersectionally at race and gender and how that plays out and all that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm curious if you could just, just for our listeners to get a sense of like what this resource looks like, maybe an example of like one of the workshops or activities that, you know, you might do with, with an organization that's um, using this toolkit. Well, the toolkit um, has a lot of different things in it. It has some activities in it. It has some, what we call foundational concepts, which are basically, Informational sheets on different concepts like intersectionality, like white supremacy culture, things that people need to know about um, when they start the work. Right. What do, you, what do you need to know? And people always ask us, why do this work in suicide prevention when people most of the people who die are white men? I mean, the majority. Right. And um, you know, there's many answers to that, not the least of which is any suicide is important. Right. And, you know, we see it, it varying. Um, you know, in different cultural and racial groups. Um, and, you know, very specifically, like, you know, African-American black boys right now, there's an uptick in suicide. I think that it's really, um, you know, critical that we think about how these issues, you know, come out. And the toolkit does other things like it has um, uh, inventories, like a series of questions to ask yourself or your organization, like how much do you talk about these things? And, you know, are they, you know, what, how are you doing your work? You know, who, you know, whose culture is being valued? Communication styles, another thing. So there are all these sort of concepts in the toolkit. There are inventories in the toolkit. There are activities in the toolkit. It's not a uh, progressive thing. Like you don't start at point at page one and go to page whatever it is. Um, 
and, you know, just go marching through it. It's like you, you need to do the inventories and figure out where you need to go. Right. So, I mean, at the coalition, I feel very fortunate because the coalition uh, has the support of Department of Public Health and they're doing equity work at the Department of Public Health Suicide Prevention Program. So th- they do work at that level. We get funded by them. So we're doing it at our level. And we, we've brought it all from our executive committee to our general membership. So it's throughout the organization. You know, the equity work is done everywhere. And they just hired me as a part-time staff in equity. So they've made the commitment and they've made the real, they've actually, you know, they're putting their money where their mouth is saying, this. Is, okay, we know this is going to continue. We, we need someone leading the way. So, you know, I, I feel very fortunate and we've had the opportunity to take this work and do some webinars too. We've done presentations all over the country and we presented in, uh, we uh, had a poster session in an international conference in Ireland a few years ago. So, you know, it's, people have really embraced it, which has been very exciting. Wow. That's, that's amazing to hear kind of the, the commitment and the positive response that you've received and, also really appreciate this, the framework that you're taking of reckoning with the reality and pushing people to reckon with the reality that this work never ends. Another thing I was going to, I just wanted to say is that um, a couple of things that are really fundamental are that this work has to be done on all levels of an organization. Can't just be siloed. Can't just be a you know committee. Can't, and it can't just be the board. Right. I mean, it has to be everywhere. Um, And the other thing is that it happens. It needs to happen at all levels of our in our life. So it has to happen in the personal level, too. So a lot of times when I go in and do a workshop, I'll do an identity exercise or something to get people to talk about these issues for themselves personally to each other. And people, oh, they are so resistant to that. They don't want to do that. They want to jump in and change their organization, but they don't want to change themselves. And it can, I don't believe it can be done unless we're working on our, uh, you know, our uh, uh, blind spots in terms of equity, unless we're working on the places where we have growth edges. We can't do this work for an organization. Like, you know, you just bring all your bias into the organization and then you have all these blind spots and you're doing it kind of haphazardly. I'm, I'm curious, like in the moment when you're receiving that type of pushback or you're kind of sitting with others discomfort how you respond in those moments oh i think we'd like to level set the fact that discomfort is actually a good thing because if you're not uncomfortable then you're not probably not doing the work right the other thing is that discomfort is different than being unsafe and that's the thing i think that people kind of get you know uh, like they feel uncomfortable and then they feel unsafe but it's not the same thing you can be uncomfortable and be safe. You know, like you're not you're not going to get, you know, hurt or shot at or you know, something like that. You know, for sometimes for people of color, it's not a matter of I mean, it's a matter of discomfort, but it's also a matter of being unsafe. So I think it's really important to make that distinction and, you know, to know that, you know, discomfort is part of the process. I'd like to shift gears a little bit to hear about some of your current work as um, the training director for the National Asian American and Pacific Islander Mental Health Association. Um, Specifically, I'd be curious to to learn more about your role there in centering the voices of Asian Americans, both um, young people and adults with lived experience. Sure, sure. So um, I actually have two positions at NAPIMA, which is the training director, and I'm also the director of a network of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders with lived experience. Uh, and we call that network NAPIAN, which is the National Asian American uh, Pacific Islander Empowerment Network. Um, at NAPIMA, we have a very strong focus on uh, uh, people with lived experience and with youth, in fact. Um, we have a program called Friends Do Make a Difference, where youth can start talking about mental health issues together, learn how to talk about them, learn how to, you know, talk with their friends, that kind of thing, Um, you know, know what to do if someone, you know, is expressing uh, feelings of suicidality and that kind of thing. Um, 
We also have Nopian, which is the network of people with lived experience. And, um, and it's just being developed. But the vision is to have a network that does two things. One is uh, supports people in the network, right? Because as Asian Americans and as people with lived experience, you know, this, this is not like, you know, a highly supported group of folk, right? I mean, we're, we're kind of out there. And, um, and in the lived experience community, there aren't a whole lot of Asian Americans, and the Asian American community, there's not a whole lot of people talking about mental health. So, you know, we kind of land in a particular spot. And um, so and so there's this need to support each other. Um, there's also a need to be a voice, you know, a voice of people that experience from the Asian American community to talk about the specific needs we have, or, you know, around breaking stigma, around, you know, uh, dealing with the model minority and the impact that has. So those kinds of things as well. Um, I'm hoping um, uh, to develop a speakers bureau where people could come, you know, could go out and speak about their experiences. Um, I also uh, have this idea of developing what I call a resource bureau. Like what if you're writing a grant and you need the voice of a person with lived experience, you know, who's uh, uh, Asian American? You know, this would allow, you know, a, a, a resource where, it's, you know, they could they could hire. And I mean, I think it's really important that we talk about, it, you know, you'd hire the person. They wouldn't volunteer for you. Um, but, uh, you know, to provide that input to review the grant or whatever that needed, needed to be. Um, the other thing uh, we're working on is, um, you know, so the Speakers Bureau the uh, resource bureau, and then also, um, you know, the uh, some special interest groups. So things like parenting, you know, what does it mean to be a parent? Like, I mean, I, I feel very strong as a parent who has lived experience in the Asian, as an Asian American. So this like, you know, how do you, you know, what are the issues of, about parenting? LGBTQ plus, what are the issues, you know, if, if you add that identity onto the identities you have? So, um, so Nopian, you know, is, uh, uh, I think, going to, is an important um, network because we are so invisible and, you know, silenced a lot. We're doing a um, summit in San Francisco on April 14th and 15th. Um, and that summit is focusing on youth and people with lived experience. And that was really important to us because it was it was important to take the sort of most disenfranchised voices and say, you know, we need to pay attention to them. Yeah. And it's such important work and reminds me of what you were describing of exactly like those compounded intersectional identities and really addressing the, the ways in which people have been silenced across so many different um, identities and forms of marginalization and I was also thinking as you were talking of, you know, this image that you laid out at the very beginning of our conversation of you, you know, having a speaking event or doing a training and having kind of a line out the door of, of young Asian American women waiting to see you and kind of that, that need and hunger to talk about their experience and to have that representation. And I'm curious how, as you've been sort of building and beginning this to create this network, what the response has been. Um, you know, within the Asian American community broadly and how your work has been received? Overall, I, I think it's been received well. I mean, people are interested in what we're doing. You know, I also feel like, you know, we're just beginning, so people don't necessarily know we're out there. Um, and if people do want to join the network, they can go to Napima's website, which is N A A P I M H A. Dot org, napima.org. If you want to join and just find out what we're doing, go to our website. Uh, you can also uh, register for the conference from the website. And I uh, kind of another question in this vein that I had is you were speaking to, you know, your own experiences having, you know, being an individual with lived experience, being Japanese American, um, and, you know, being the vision that you have of creating these, this network, um, and also the wealth of experience you've had kind of navigating different leadership positions and academic research, legislative spaces. And I'm, I'm curious what you think 
really meaningful inclusion of people with lived experience throughout these processes truly looks like? And, you know, what does that take um, for that to actually happen? I mean, so often we're tokenized, right? Like on a panel, right? You have a panel, you have doctor, ja, da, 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 four doctors, and then the person with lived experience. And they're often last, right? So right before lunch and everyone else has gone over and everyone wants to go to lunch and no one wants to listen to you. So one thing people can do is think about whose voices are you favoring and, you know, elevating and whose you're not. What does that look like? So if you're going to include the voices of people with lived experience, you got to start from the beginning. Whatever you're doing, you got to like include them from the ground up because it doesn't help in some ways to do the token list thing, you know, where, oh, okay, we'll have them look at it and just put a rubber stamp on it. That's not inclusion. That's, that's basically, you know, using someone to be able to say, oh, we, we ran it by a person with lived experience and really think about like compensating people with expertise. This is a subject matter expert. And like, if you were to invite a professor to be a subject matter expert, you wouldn't say, oh, could you do this for free, please? You know, your, your experience is, is, and what you're saying to the person with lived experience is, your experience is not as important as these other experiences. I think that that um, uh, basically, you know, exploitation of a person. The voices of people with lived experience have been marginalized for so long, like to center them or to move them toward the center is going to take some effort. You know what I mean? Because first you have to sort of identify people with lived experience who are willing to talk about it and willing to, you know, be part of that process. And there are certainly a lot of us out there. Napima put on a conference in New York a few years ago, and I was on the panel of people with lived experience at this conference. And we started the panel. We started the conference. And it was a whole panel of us. It wasn't five doctors and a person with lived experience last. I've been on... Um, the program of different panels on things where the organizers left off my PhD because I was the person with lived experience, but they knew it. I gave them my bio, but the, there was, was doctor, 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 Pata. I'm like, I don't care. I, I wrote them back. I said, you know, I don't care. You know, I, I really don't, you know, hold a lot of whatever about the titles, but if you're going to call everyone else doctor, you need to call me doctor too. That type of microaggression really goes to show what people's stereotypes are about people with experience. I guess one one follow up is I, I'm curious, just given sort of all of these barriers to you know this meaningful inclusion and these microaggressions and just forms of discrimination, and unfortunately the ways that you know folks with lived experiences voices are so frequently co opted in the process of you know, under the guise of inclusion, you know, what that experience was like for you to sort of choose to, you know, hold that identity and be open about your, your own experiences. Yeah. Um, at first it was scary, like personally, right? I mean, I, I was teaching at a university and I was teaching a course on equity in education and I was struggling and I knew if I had any physical illness, you know, if I had kidney disease or if I had breast cancer, even, you know, I mean, even that, I mean, I would have shared that with my class pretty much right away. Like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm doing with this, you know, we're going to work through it, whatever. But it was really hard to share the fact that I had a mental health challenge, that I was struggling with depression and that it was getting in the way of my work, which it was. And I finally did. And then I had students come to my office and tell me, thank you, and that they struggle too, which was a powerful message to me that sharing, um, yeah, yeah it, it was scary and it could have backfired, I mean, depending on the administration and all that kind of you know stuff. Um, but I also felt like it creates an opportunity to talk about these things um, that people need. We need that. We definitely need that. We have such a top-down system. You know, the doctors are telling people, you know, this is, this is what you should do for your treatment plan. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about me? You know, where, where's my voice in that? Um, when I do speaking about my own personal life, I, I talk about my treatment plan. 
but I, I use that term intentionally to reclaim it. Like my treatment plan includes bicycle riding. My treatment plan includes art. My treatment plan includes writing. In addition to psychotherapy, and I do take medication, so medication, and other kind of self-care things, right? Acupuncture you know, or whatever. You know, I mean, but my treatment plan is the whole thing and none of it's, none of it's negotiable. So I think we need to really, you know, rethink that, rethink about what it means um, and what it means to, to be in treatment and to, I mean, I, I always say I really hate all the words that describe people in my position, um, patient, like medical model, client, business model, you know, um, what are the other ones? Oh, consumer. It's like, oh, let's go to the capitalist situation. Like, you know, let's let's use that language. Okay, cool. I'm a consumer. Well, you know, yeah, and I don't really like being called a consumer. You know, um, I always, I, 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 like, I can never, I haven't found a word that I like better, like a one word, but I, I kind of joke and say I want to be a collaborative recovery partner with my practitioners because that's what I am. They're not doing it for me. I'm doing it but I'm in collaboration with their guidance. I love that phrase. And I think it speaks to like at all levels, like just like you were saying, this whole framework of needing to reshift the ways we're thinking about um, mental health, equity, it's at every level and it's centering autonomy, collaboration, true partnership at every level of the process. Absolutely, absolutely. You, You know, you mentioned, I know you're, an avid biker. Um, you also mentioned art and creating art as part of your treatment plan. Um, and I know you're a jewelry maker and also a poet. How has art shaped all of this for you? Like how has your identity as an artist influenced your role as an educator, an activist, or, or vice versa? How has like your life experience influenced your art in that sense? It took me a really long time to be able to claim the identity of artist. And I think that's because, you know, we have this idea that unless you're trained or went to art school or something, you're not an actual artist. So that was something that I had to get over. And and but the thing that's so ironic, of course, is that as a teacher, I'm always like, yeah, of course, you're an artist. Of course, you're a writer. But for myself, I was like, "Mm -hmm, can I really claim that? Right. But when I went on disability and people would ask me, well, what do you do? You know, that's the, the office, the, you know, the lead at a party, right? So what do you do? And you really can't say, well, I lie in bed and try to recover. It's just, it doesn't fly. Uh, it's kind of a conversation stopper. So I started saying things like, well, I'm, I'm a writer and I'm an artist and I'm working on these things, which was true. Cause that's the only thing I could really do was art and writing <laughs> at the time, because I was, I mean, and yes, Definitely art has been a way that I can express how I'm feeling. I like being able to do things with my hands. I like being able to create things. I try to use that that lens in the work I do as an educator as well. Um, you know, I often try to include either, you know, spoken words sometimes or sometimes, you know, different kinds of ways of uh, accessing information, you know, even, you know, I mean, you know, healing through the arts is huge, but also, you know, just using various ways of engaging with materials. I mean, as an educator, you know, you, you know, learning styles, all that stuff, right? You know, so, and part of it is using that creative mind, you know, using the, you know, like drawing or something as opposed to just using words. Like art as another tool for enhancing accessibility, creativity, and and kind of countering these dominant paradigms of, you know, linear, rational, evidence-based thought. It's sort of like we need it all, but what's been valued in terms of evidence-based and this and that, you know, has limited us, I think, in our perspective and our willingness to like look at stuff. Before we move into um, hearing you share one of your your pieces, if, if you're comfortable with that, um, I'd be just be curious if if there's anything else that you you would want to add or or speak to. Actually, I do have something. I am very um, concerned about issues of parenting because I feel like we don't talk about it enough. And I've been thinking, you know, this you know this may or may not be relevant, but I've been thinking about um, the importance of 
talking to our kids about psychosis. Because my mother was psychotic, but no one ever told us what was going on. That's a very dysregulating, right? You know, so, you know, it's like, you know, it's like someone saying the sky is green. And then as a kid, you're saying, mom's saying the sky is green. I think it's blue. What's real? It's very disturbing, you know? And I think that there are ways, if my mother, you know, if someone had sat me down and said, sometimes your mom doesn't see the world clearly. I mean, you know, you can say it in words that don't, don't have to be psychosis, you know? I mean, you can talk about, you know, sometimes she thinks things, you know, are like she hears things that you don't, might not hear, you know? And what does that mean for that kid, right? So I, I just, I just feel like, you know, we need to really think about what it means to be parents, how we talk to our kids, you know, how we talk and when you talk, you know, in general, how we talk about all this kind of stuff in general, but specifically to children. So I just feel like, you know, uh, one of my responsibilities as a parent is to think about how to communicate my condition, my situation to my daughter so it doesn't so it has the least impact on her mental health and that she has the most understanding and compassion she can have for people who have lived experience oh i i really appreciate that and it absolutely resonates with me as well and wishing that you know some of those conversations could have been had for for me as a as a young person and understanding that and i think um, it really speaks to the importance too of having a safe space for parents with maybe similar conditions or experiences to come together, share, you know, support one another in that process of parenting. And I know you mentioned that the um, Napima was going to potentially have like a parenting special interest group, or if that is already begun. I'm I'm curious if any because we do absolutely have listeners and readers who are you know parents and maybe tuning in, I'm curious, you know, what would be the best way for them to get connected or involved if, if they're interested? Yeah. The special interest groups aren't up yet, but they should, uh, uh, um, you know, apply to, to be part of the, uh, Nopian network. And there's a place to put a message and just say, I'm interested in a parent special interest group or whatever their interests are. That's fine. All right. Well, thank you so much, Pata, but to, to close us out, I would love to, you know, I think our listeners would, would love to hear one of your, one of your spoken word pieces. Okay. So I'm going to read a, a piece of poetry called uh, My Story is Full of Lies. And I actually originally wrote this for a presentation on the social determinants of health. Um, but this is my personal story in relation to the social determinants of health. My story is full of lies. When I was 12, my diagnosis was major depression. At 16, I attempted suicide. At 35, my diagnosis included dissociative disorder not otherwise specified. At 40, I took 19 pills to combat chronic and severe major depression and complex PTSD. Perhaps this is not surprising. Since my aunt died by suicide, my uncle faced serious depression, and my mother had bipolar disorder. One could say that genetics is the cause of my mental illness. This is a lie. In 1942, my dad and his family were imprisoned in a camp in Topaz, Utah. There's nothing there now but tumbleweeds, hard dry ground, dust storms, and a plaque with an American flag on it. After camp, when my dad was in high school, a math teacher said he wouldn't amount to anything. He earned a Ph.D. in mathematics. But trauma and racism silenced him. He became reclusive. I can only wonder what impact this has had on me. And although I grew up solidly middle class, I also grew up in a white community where I was taunted and called chink and soy sauce. I was bullied in junior high school. My mom was a crazy divorced lady. My sister's friend was forbidden from coming to our house. My mother also told me to not stand with my legs apart. It's not ladylike, she said. But closing my legs didn't stop my cousin from molesting me at six or at 16 as supervisor from groping me, not to mention the onslaught of catcalls and innuendos. A normal womanhood, one might say. This, too, is a lie. I grew to hate myself. What was there to love? After all, I was ridiculed for my race and attacked for my gender. 
When I came out as bisexual, that too was cause for pain. In high school, I hid this from my friends and my family. I hid this from the therapist in the hospital they put me in. In my 20s, friends died of AIDS. They said it was our own fault, God's wrath. This too is a lie. No one ever said, perhaps your depression and PTSD are normal reactions to racism, sexism, homophobia, and hatred. Perhaps you are not sick. Perhaps your despair is not an illness. Perhaps this is my truth. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.